lecture series brought to you by the Environmental Law Center here at Vermont Law School. I'm Jenny Rushlow, the director of the Environmental Law Center and associate dean for environmental programs at VLS. We will have time for questions and answers after today's presentation. So if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to type them in the chat at any time during the lecture and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the remaining time after the lecture concludes. Today, we are really pleased to welcome Stephen Weiss. Mr. Weiss is the founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project, whose objective is to obtain legal personhood and fundamental common law rights for non-human animals. He's practiced animal protection law throughout the country for 35 years. He's the author of numerous books and articles and has taught animal rights law at Harvard, Vermont, and many other law schools. In 2016, Unlocking the Cage, a film about the work of the Non-Human Rights Project, debuted at the Sundance Film Festival and was nominated for an Emmy in the category of Best Social Issue Documentary in 2018. Today, Mr. Weiss will present a talk titled The Struggle to Gain Legal Rights for Non-Human Animals. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Weiss. Well, thank you. Hello. Let me see, I'm talking to the folks at Vermont and uh, as was noticed, uh, I actually uh, taught at Vermont and uh, I taught in the summers at uh, the Vermont Law School, I think for 25 years, uh, 1990 is when I began. And at that time, uh, I, I think I was perhaps teaching the second, uh, uh, the second uh, class that had ever been taught about an, uh, non-human animals at, at a law school. I don't remember what the first one was, but I think there, there might have been one a, a few years ago. So that was in 1990 when I, when I began teaching there. And uh, when I started teaching uh, at the Vermont Law School as, as, as the first person to teach or the second person to teach such a class anywhere, um, uh, I began teaching about about the idea that non-human animals uh, should have should be per, protected. I tried to uh, talk to my students about uh, about how they were they were being abused, how how, how they've been used. Uh, and then as the year slowly went by, uh, I began working more and more on the question of um, whether or, whether or not. First, I worked on whether or not, and then I worked on how a non-human animal would be able to get legal rights. And uh, that I, I was working on all the way until I, I can't remember when I last taught. It may have been 2015, 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, uh, and so I, I began, and so I stopped teaching there. Uh, but I, uh, but as I said, I've actually taught at 10 law schools, including Harvard and Stanford and Vermont. I also have taught at the at Tel Aviv Law School. Uh, each year I teach at, at Barcelona, at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, and uh, the uh, the world of 2021 with respect to you know how or why a non-human animal you know should ever have a legal right is is universes universes apart from how it was when I I, I began in 1990 when we when I brought my students in with me as we began to try to understand what the problems were and how we might be able to help non-human animals. So what I taught then, actually, and what I still what I still think about now, because I think at that time I was president of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, which I had, which I would be president, I think, from about 1985 to about 1995. Uh, so we, we were working on welfare, but uh, but uh, just a few few years before, I'd begun to think about the issue of um, you know, how could how could we really solve the problem that non-human animals face? Because so many of them are, are abused. And the reason that they are, they're abused, they're killed, um, the re and they're tortured. And the reason uh, being is that they're legal things. And so I began to, to realize, understand, that, uh, that the world you know, has, been, um, has been bifurcated into you know, uh, to things and persons generally. So on, as you've had this um, thick wall between the persons of the world and the things of the world, and on one side of the of, of, of this wall, you would have things, and the other side of the wall, you would have persons. Now, one of the things that we try to um, make judges understand, because when we go in, judges oftentimes believe, um, for reasons which we still don't quite understand, that um, that person 
is a synonym for human. So that some of the judges we go in front of now uh, believe that that all uh, persons are humans and all humans are persons. And we try to begin the process and complete it if we can of explaining to them just what I'm explaining to you now, except I have to do it a lot faster. Uh, and so on, on one hand, um, you've had uh, all the things of the world and uh, for, for several thousands of years, or at least 2,000 years. And so a, uh, a thing is an entity you know, who lacks the capacity for any, any sort of legal right. And they're essentially the, the slaves of persons. Persons are entities who have the capacity for one right, or 10 rights, or 100 rights, or an infinite number of rights. And they oftentimes become the masters of of uh, the of, of things, so as as so many things are are also slaves. So you have persons who have the capacity for potentially an infinite number of rights, and you have things who lack the capacity for any any sort of rights at all. And so all non-human animals, until very recently, as that is, is beginning to change, um, all human animals um, were, were seen as being things for since it began in Roman times, two thousand years ago. They've been things meant they they lack the capacity for any sort of a of a legal right. But there were there were humans who might also be things at some time. For example, in the 13th century in in England, Jews were actually seen as things. They really lacked you know every kind of of legal right. Sometimes you might have had Native American Na uh, Aborigines, including um, uh, American indigenous folks, sometimes you might have had children, uh, sometimes you might have women who were essentially things in which they lacked the capacity for any sort of a legal right. Certainly uh, in the year 2021, you know, all human beings have long ago, decades ago, been moved from the capacity of thing to the, to, um, the category of being a, a person. But as you probably know, there's, there's oftentimes been uh, many non-human animals, uh, I'm sorry, there, there have been many entities who are not humans, non-humans, uh, who have also been persons. Um, corporations are persons. Probably Vermont Law School is a person. You know, the state of Vermont is, is, is a person. The United States is, is, is a person. Um, so there's been you know, a, a very large number, number of persons. And uh, over the years, um, slowly, uh, some non-human animals are starting to become persons, but but there have been other things uh, as well. So, for example, in, in India, in the 1920s, there was a uh, case that came down from the English court um, <clears throat> saying that Hindu idols were persons, so they had uh, the the right to possess certain kind of property. Uh, in the in, in the years that that have gone by, uh, uh, in New Zealand, for example. Uh, uh, a uh, national park is is a person. A uh, the Wanganui River is a person. Uh, in India, in 2000, the Indian Supreme Court said that uh, that the um, holy books of the Sikh religion were persons. Uh, in Colombia, the Colombia Supreme Court has said that 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 part of the Amazon rainforest that that is within the country of Colombia you know, is is a person. So these kinds of terms are not really technical terms. What, what they mean is, is that when you are a person, the courts of a jurisdiction, you know, view you, view any entity who is a person as, as being, being important, as, as, as counting for something. That means you're a person. Uh, if you're not important and you'll never count um, at all, then you, you end up being a thing. So the problem has been for so long that all not non-human animals have, you know, have always been things. That is beginning to change, and sometimes we have to it, explain to judge that it actually has changed. But they're so used to non-human animals being being things that sometimes they actually can't grasp what it is we're talking about. Even, for example, uh, all 50 states now have some kind of a of a pet trust statute, which means that that humans can leave um, can leave trusts uh, for, uh, to take care of, and it it uh, changes from state to state. But for certainly, if you're a dog or a cat, uh, every state allows you to to set up a trust that uh, 
that leads um, money to take care of a dog or cat. Now, many times those are seen as beneficiary less trusts so that the dogs and cats, for example, are not beneficiaries. There's no, there is no benefic beneficiary to the trust. But there are many states in which these are not beneficiary of statutes that dogs or cats or other non-human animals, you know, actually uh, are seen as beneficiaries of trusts. Well, when you're a beneficiary of a trust, that means that you are a person because as a, you are a beneficiary and you have the right to the corpus of a trust. And those, uh, those also have... Uh, trustees and they have folks who, who enforce the trust if the trustees don't act the way they should. But the important thing is that a non-human item will be the beneficiary of a trust. And we have filed perhaps nine cases so far in two states. We're about to, in New York and then Connecticut, and we're about to file another one in California, Colorado. Also, we're, we're going to be filing one in Israel, uh, in uh, India, and we work in, in other countries as well. But uh, uh, in all of the U.S. cases where we have filed, each time we go we go into court, we try to explain to the judge that, for example, in in the state of New York, and I think we've probably you know filed seven of them, uh, that um, that we point out to the judge that the the um, the right that we're trying to get to we're trying to get the judge to except is not the first right of our client in, in that state, but it's the second right because our client is a beneficiary of a trust. And we've made a trust, and we've made a trust that are a, we've made our client a beneficiary of a trust. She already has a right as a beneficiary. She's already a person. We're not asking the court to say that for the first time that an, a non-human animal can be a person, but the legislature has already said that they are persons. Uh, so far, we've had not a single judge, and, and I've been, we've been in front of uh, probably 30 of them now, you know, in various appellate courts, trial courts, uh, with one exception, uh, only one of perhaps 30 judges uh, ever ever listened to what we're talking about in oral argument, ever talked about it, ever wrote it, wrote it in, in, in an opinion. And there was one judge uh, who spent about, I think, two or three sentences on it, didn't quite understand what it is we were doing. And, uh, but at least she understood that we were making that sort of an argument. The other judges in all the cases that, that we've filed at all levels have never even once uh, noticed or, or agreed that, uh, that our client, who is a beneficiary of a trust in that, in that state, um, is actually a person because only a person can be a beneficiary. So you're either... In every in every state, you know, you're either going to be a person or or you or you're going to be a thing. Now, being a thing is worth worth nothing at all. You, know, you are you are a slave. You are an entity uh, that does not count at all in that in that state. That can be used for virtually any purpose. Uh, and sometimes humans will pass welfare statutes of some kind. Um, they they the uh, non-human animals who are slaves can't. Uh, can't enforce them. Uh, who knows who can enforce them? Obviously, if you just look around our country, no matter how many welfare statutes we have, there's just a vast number, billions and billions of non non-human animals of a large number of species are like are just treated terribly. So, being a person though is a, is extraordinarily important, and that's what the Non-Human Rights Project focuses on. So if I can point to, for example, Dean Roscoe Powell, who wrote, um, who wrote the book uh, Jurisprudence, I think that was in 1959, um, he wrote that, uh, that persons, and I quote, persons are the unit of the legal order. So if you're a person, you are a unit of our legal order. But if you're not a person, if you're a thing, you're not, you're not a unit of our legal order. Uh, if you look at the international uh, treaties. If you look at you know, uh, Article 6, for example, of the Universal Declaration of Human, of, of Human Rights, Article 6 says that everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. If you look to Article 16 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, it says everyone shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Well, actually, both of those should not be Article 6 or Article 16. They should be Article 1. Because the most important thing is that, is that uh, uh, you are, you know, are 
persons. You are, are um, you have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. And if you don't have that right, if you can't be a person, then the Universal Declaration of Human Rights would not apply to you, and the un or the, the Convention on Civil and Political Rights would not apply to you because you wouldn't be a person because only persons have the right to recognition you know, everywhere in the law. So. The Non-Human Rights Project, which uh, which I, I, I think we began in 1995, it's now 25 years old. Um, our you know our work is to begin to try to to persuade courts and also persuade parliaments or legislatures that at least some non-human animals you know can can indeed be be persons, and they so they will count. Uh, they will have certain rights that that then can be uh, can can be um, supported, and and they won't be able to be treated the way they have been. So in 2013, after the Non-Human Rights Project spent 18 years preparing, uh, and in fact um, in 1985, that's when I, be, I I I I concluded that in order that in order for non-human animals to be treated any any appropriate way that they're going to have to be to have their their legal capacity as a legal thing change from a legal thing to a legal person. In 1985, I wouldn't I wouldn't be having this talk. Obviously, in 1985, it was going to be still five more years before I began teaching one of the one of the first courses anywhere, uh, which I've always called either animal rights law or animal rights jurisprudence. I call it animal rights law for probably uh, 20 years, and then uh, you know. Ten years ago, I began calling uh, uh, calling it animal rights jurisprudence. So in 2013, uh, after 28 years of preparation, uh, and that included things like like I was doing teaching. I, I was teaching at Vermont. I was teaching. I began teaching at Harvard Law School in 2000 and other places. Began teaching. Began writing books. Began writing law review articles. Began speaking to judges. Began speaking to lawyers. If, if you'll hold, uh, hold on for one, one moment, my dog is breaking into my room here in my office. Hold on. Okay, now you can only listen. Okay, I've told him he can only listen. He can't bother me anymore uh, while, while I'm talking. So in, in 2000 and um, uh, in 2013, the, non, the non-human rights project, you know, after you know, 28 years of preparation, um, uh, filed its first it, its first lawsuits. Now, those first lawsuits, we filed three of them, and I think, and since then, we filed either seven seven or eight more since. But when we filed though, we filed three of them. What what they were were the following: we brought a lawsuit under the common law, and we brought it. We brought it as a, a, a common law writ of habeas corpus, and we brought it on behalf of a chimpanzee. We brought it in New York State. And so why did we do all, all of those things? So one of the most important issues that we talked about, that we thought through, and we would, we, we would argue about it for years, was, uh, was whether we should bring a lawsuit under the common law, or whether we should bring the bring the lawsuit under a statute, or under a treaty, or under under a constitution, and so early on we we decided that these sorts of novel cases should not be brought under uh, under the un, under a statute, under an international treaty, or under a constitution. The reason being is that when you use the word person, when a constitution uses the word person, when a statute uses the word person, uh, when a um, when international treaty uses the word person, when the judge uh, that who we are before is trying to to look to to see whether or not the word person, you know, in that state, uh, in that state constitution or federal constitution or, or state or federal statute or an international treaty, the question was when when those were enacted, when they were passed, did say the legislature intend that when they use person, they intended to include a non-human animal? And the answer almost certainly is no, no, they didn't. Uh, that was, for example, uh, one thing that, that uh, Peter realized when it filed a lawsuit in 2012, you know, under the 13th Amendment. 
um, the question was whether, whether when the 13th Amendment, the United States Constitution passed, was it meant to apply to, and you know, an orchid sea world, was it meant to apply to any non-human animal? And the answer, predictably, was no. Uh, the, and uh, similarly, when they brought a lawsuit on, 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 on under copyright statute, uh, when the copyright statute was violated, did the um, the uh, Congress in passing it they, did they mean that an author, for example, was going to be a, a um, non-human? And the answer was no. And so generally, that's what occurs. We we don't predict or expect that a that a court is going to find that some third party who wrote a statute that has the word person or something like that in it uh, is going to uh, to have intended that a non-human animal uh, be included in that definition. So the common law, though, is something different. So the common law means that a, that a, a judge shouldn't be looking at what someone else wrote in a common law they will look at what the judges wrote because the judges make the common law. Judges make the common law. Uh, they, and, and sometimes they, they can take decades or centuries, but they continue to, to and they, they change the common law. They take into account um, how public morality changes, how scientific evidence changes, how, how uh, uh, public experience changes, and they keep, uh, keep trying to keep the common law uh, modern. If, if they're good common law judges, sometimes they aren't good common law judges. And common law judges might sometimes forget you know, what their job is as, as a common law judge. Sometimes we, we have to remind them, but, but it's important that, that they, they use the common law. So, for example, when we bring a lawsuit and we're, we're, we're asking that, that a word or a sentence that the judges themselves use in the common law, it could have been last year, could have been last century, could have been 500 years ago. When we, we ask, we, we say, look, your job as a common law judge is to keep the law updated. So you're and, and that's you're you're supposed to, for example, look at at at, at the uh, progress of science, which is why a lot of our cases involve science or morality. For example, sometimes we'll bring philosophers in to testify as to what how philosophy has has evolved, or just simply public experience. But the important thing, they don't look to somebody else outside of the courts. They'll look to those who sat on their court or sat on another court, uh, whether it's decades or centuries ago. So the common law, you know, is, is really important. Now, what kind of common law cause of action, though, do we bring? So we bring, you know, we seek a common law rid of habeas corpus. So a habeas corpus means that, and, and there, if there's been a person who has been detained against their will, then some, either, either they or most likely some third person can then uh, bring a writ of habeas corpus, and the judge can make a determination whether the, the the person who's being detained against their will, if they have been, then they'll order that they be uh, that they be you know, freed immediately. So we bring, um, and so far in the, our first seven years of work, all of our cases have been have been a common law writs of habeas corpus, where we sought common law writs of habeas corpus. So why are we why are we bringing habeas corpus? I mean, why don't we bring some other cause of action? There's a whole lot of reasons for it. One of them is this. Common law has been known as the Great Writ, capital G, capital W. It's the Great Writ. And judges understand that it's really important. Uh, as, as, I, if, as, we, as we talk about in our, our cases, and I might, if I can re have enough time today, I'll talk about that as well, is that humans are, are autonomous beings. Uh, if they are being imprisoned against their will, they're being deprived of one of the most important things of being a human being, their autonomy. Uh, they are being, they, they aren't allowed to move about. So judges you know, care about habeas corpus cases. And we feel that we've always believed that, that, that judges are likely to, ca to take the case that we have on behalf of non-human animals more seriously um, because we're bringing we're a great writ, we're seeking a great writ, habeas corpus, and in light of our of our um, 
experts who file sometimes exceedingly long and complex affidavits that make it clear to to any court how extraordinarily cognitively complex and autonomous our clients might be. You know, first they were chimpanzees. Um, we probably had a total uh, over several cases, perhaps of, of nine of the most um, important and well-respected chimpanzee experts in the world, including uh, Jane Goodall, who's one of the um, who's one of the directors always has been of the Non-Human Rights Project. But she and many people, who, many scientists, who spent you know some or sometimes virtually all of their professional life uh, studying chimpanzees, um, have you know, brought um, many affidavits in which the object of them was to show to, to judges how cognitively complex and autonomous chimpanzees were. When we bring a lawsuit on behalf of an elephant, same thing happens. Uh, we probably have in our latest cases, probably have seven of the world's greatest elephant experts who spend a lot of time explaining how cognitively complex and autonomous uh, elephants are, uh, whether they're uh, Asian elephants or, or whether they're African elephants, and I think they were African elephants were just last week um, divided into I, th I can't I can't remember if they're called jungle elephants or tree elephants or some kind of an elephant that's not an African elephant anymore. So everyone cares about great writs, and every and uh, and every, everyone understands that any entity who is c extraordinarily cognitively complex and autonomous. Uh, they they need to pay attention to to um, what's going on in order to release them uh, from being detained against their will. The second thing is that third party standing is generally permissible in habeas corpus cases. That's a real that's a real important thing. I can't just walk into court and and uh, bring a, a a lawsuit on behalf of a non non human animal. I just you know I I am a person or the Non-human rights is, is a is a person, you know, but we we aren't injured. Non-human animals are injured terribly, but they're not persons. Uh, there's really it, it's it, it's almost impossible to bring a third you know, to, to have a, a person like the Non-Human Rights Project, you know, bring a lawsuit on behalf of an entity uh, who is not being held in habeas corpus. It's very difficult to do that uh, because you won't be able to have standing. And so this idea is an idea that we got from um, st studying, and we spend a lot of time, you know, we we spend a lot of time studying 15th century cases in England, 16th century, 17th century, 18th and 19th century, especially in English cases. Um, we oftentimes do that uh, because we understand that that the United States and all of the states, including Vermont, uh, as well as uh, other English-speaking countries, you know, Israel. And that's why we're bringing a case there. India, that's why we're bringing a case there. You know, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, all of these members of, of the English Commonwealth, you know, at one time uh, would, would have uh, been treating, been using habeas corpus um, the way that the English did. So we study their third party standing cases. You know, one, one of the most important, for example, is the Somerset case. Somerset in the 1772 uh, case of Somerset versus Stewart, which was so important that I think uh, in around 2003, I began to work on a book that I worked three years on that, that was published in 2005 called Though the Heavens May Fall, which told the story of the Somerset case and how it was that James Somerset, who had been stolen as, you know, from Africa as a slave when he was eight years old, when he was eventually in his, around age 28 or 30, had been taken to London. Uh, eventually, uh, James Somerset decided to, um, to try to escape from his master, Charles Stewart. And Stewart then hired uh, slave catchers that I think took 73 days to actually find him in, in, in London. And they, and, uh, they then found him and uh, chained him to the deck of a ship, the Anne and Mary, and they, the Anne and Mary was then ready to uh, raise sail and sail to Jamaica, where James Somerset was going to be then um, sold in a, in a slave market where he'd be forced to, to uh, uh, pick sugar cane, harvest sugar cane for the three to five years that they were usually able, able to live be, before they died. But what happened in that case? was James Somerset, there are other people who were following James Somerset, who knew them, who knew James Somerset, knew what had happened to him. It may have been his godfathers, his godparents, we just aren't sure. Even after spending three years studying it, it was very hard for, to tell 
you know, who the godparents were and who exactly brought brought the lawsuit, because for some reason the British um, judiciary threw out the 1772 habeas corpus uh, petition for habeas corpus about 100 110 years. Ago. So I had to make a make a good guess, but 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 we did know that whoever it was you know, went before Lord Mansfield. Lord Mansfield was uh, Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench, extraordinary judge, you know, perhaps the, you know, the, the best judge ever to speak English that we ever had, the best, best English speaking judge, just an extraordinary person um, who for the first time, you know, issued a requested order to, you know, order to show cause or writ of habeas corpus, you know, on, on behalf of a human slave. First time that that happened. Now, this was extraordinary because uh, you know we have to understand when you're looking at habeas corpus is that and and that uh, a thing is, uh, may not use habeas corpus, but a person may. So when a a writ on behalf of uh, James Somerset was brought before Lord Mansfield, he could have just tossed the case, saying, um, and refused to issue the order to show cause for the writ of habeas corpus saying that that lord mansfield was the thing and so things aren't entitled to habeas corpus and therefore uh he's going to be a slave and off he goes to jamaica but instead he didn't do that um for the first time he assumed without deciding he made an assumption that it might be possible that a slave in england in 1771 at that time uh would be able to to uh, be freed pursuant to a writ of habeas corpus and I wrote about that. I wrote how it happened, you know, what time of day, um, what the background was. It's not clear how that would have gone, but it went an extraordinary way. And over the next seven months of litigation, which again was completely extraordinary, um, if you if you understand that, you know, uh, in, in the Court of King's Bench, you might have uh, 30 or 40 jury trials in, in one day. Uh, sometimes people's... Um, uh, even a, a felony trial might last for 10 minutes. Uh, the idea that, that you'd have this habeas corpus case going on and off against, uh, uh, Charles, uh, against uh, Charles Stewart on behalf of, of Somerset was just extraordinary. And so he finally, in, on June 22nd, 1772, Lord Mansfield said that that slavery was so odious, the human slavery was so odious that, uh, that, that the common law would not support it. They said we so he released him and he was no longer a slave, you know, through it through the common law writ of habeas corpus. We rely upon that case because that was in June 22nd, 1772. But what's happened since then is virtually every state in the United States, when it came in, would say that we're going to adopt that each state is going to adopt the common law of England, though on different times. Someone, someone say the uh, July 4th, 1776. Some say uh, the Battle of Concord and Lexington was it April 18th, 1775. Some have said other times as well as, as, as states came in. But virtually all of them, whatever date they had would have included the Somerset case. So that, so when we go in and argue a case, we say, well, the Somerset case uh, was decided in England you know, on June 22nd, 1772, but it's brought in, it's part of the law of the state, the state as well. So we want, we want you judges to take into consideration um, what happens when you have an entity who might be a thing, but they may, but, but they might not be a thing. Could they possibly be a person? And if they could even possibly be a person, as Lord Mansfield then issued the writ of habeas corpus on behalf of, of, um, of Somerset, we asked the judges they'd be so kind to issue the writ of habeas corpus or the order to show cause you know, on behalf of the non-human animal who we are representing, saying at least let us get into court so that we can then begin to argue as to whether or not our client ought to be a person which who has the capacity for 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 rights that we and the only right we we seek is the right to bodily liberty protected by habeas corpus. There's another reason we bring um, our, our our suits under um, habeas corpus. Oh, and as, as you know, uh, in that in in law, in there's something called res judicata or claim preclusion, issue preclusion, and so say you and I engage in in a writ of in, in a contract, and what happens is that. I claim that you that, that you breached our contract. So I would then bring a bring a breach of contract action against you. I would lose, and then what happens if I didn't like that? I would then bring a second breach of contract action against you. 
What that means when that occurs, the judge would say that as a result of claim preclusion, res judicata, that the judge would be required to, to dismiss the case if it was brought as, as, a, as, as an affirmative defense, hey, I've already won once, the judge would then be required to dismiss the case. That would be the end. Habeas corpus is perhaps one of the only causes of action that, that is, is not under habeas, that is not under res judicata. That if we bring a lawsuit and we lose, that doesn't mean we can't bring it again. And we can't bring it again and again and again. There's never res judicata. And we understood that. That's one of the reasons we use habeas, we, you know, we use habeas corpus is because we understand when we go in front of a judge, that's only likely that that judge will have ever even thought about this or heard of what we're doing and won't really understand what we're doing. So we, so it's, we're, we're going to win the first time. I mean, we're going to lose the first time or the second time or the third time or the fifth time or the 10th time, whatever. We keep bringing writs of habeas corpus. So in, in, in New York, for example, uh, we sought writs of habeas corpus multiple times on behalf of all of our chimpanzees. Uh, right now, the, the, the sole case we have in front of an elephant is the first time, but it's conceivable that we could bring it again. Now, what happened when human prisoners began to bring you know, writs of habeas corpus? Res judicata does not apply to them, but there have been statutes passed that make it harder and harder to for, you, for a person, for a, a prisoner to bring a second or third or more writ of habeas corpus. But we were studying it in New York. We, we saw that there was one prisoner, for example, who brought five writs of habeas corpus. And the fifth one is when he started to make some kind of, of, um, of, of advancement of, of his arguments. So we've now uh, gone in front of the Court of Appeals. We've now brought... Uh, asked the Court of Appeals three times to to uh, hear our writ of habeas corpus uh, on three different non-human animals. And so the first time, the Court of Appeals said no, unanimously. Uh, second time, the Court of Appeals said no in, in New York, unanimously. The third time, they also said no, but una unanimity no, was no longer there. Uh, Judge Eugene Fahey, uh, who sits on New York's Court of Appeal, and so far is the only judge of the highest court of any jurisdiction in the United States to, to hear you know, any, any of our case at all, he said essentially that, uh, that after thinking about what we've been doing for the last three years, he had changed his mind. And he thinks now the Court of Appeals in New York should hear our case. And he thinks that we have very powerful arguments that the Court of Appeals should be taken into consideration. So the third time, uh, although he was, he was the only judge, uh, now, uh, in one of our cases, our first case involving an, an elephant, and by the way, in, in that case, uh, he made it really clear that all of the cases that had ruled against us on behalf of chimpanzees, they were wrong, and they were wrong for the reasons that we, we had been arguing. Uh, so now we have a fourth case in front of the Court of Appeals uh, that we had brought, brought on on behalf of, the, of an elephant named um, in, uh, who, named Happy, who has been um, imprisoned, we argue, illegally in, in the Bronx Zoo for over 40 years. And uh, I'll tell you about that if I, ha if I have time, but, but the, we actually lost at, at an appellate level. And uh, what happened then is that we've now gone for the fourth time. We filed that case, that appeal, a request for further review in, um, in January, and it's now April 9th. We have not yet heard whether the court is going to hear us. We, we, we hope the court will. Um, this time, the court knows that one of its judges believes it should hear the case. Also, I believe that up to now, there's, there has been a five amicus briefs filed. Uh, one of them has been uh, a, a brief filed on behalf of 50 law professors who teach, uh, who teach in, I think, in three countries, the UK, um, Canada, and the United States, saying, look, you have to take this case because the decisions that were lower that caused them to lose are just flat out wrong, which of course we've, all, we've always known that. Uh, there's been a habeas corpus case by Catholic theologians. There's been habeas corpus, uh, habeas corpus case by habeas corpus scholars. There's another one by a dozen or more of uh, philosophers in, in, in Canada and in the United States. And there's been a specific one by a uh, Harvard law professor, Lawrence Tribe, who says they ought to take the case and, and we we ought to win. I think the longer they, they take, they're probably more and more, uh, more and more coming in, uh, but they haven't, uh, who knows, they're going to, they'll decide either yes or no on Monday, um, April 12th, or it'll be May 12th or June 12th. We have no idea. So th there's another reason we bring um, 
habeas corpus writs on, on behalf of our client, our non-human animal client, habeas corpus is a summary writ, which means it happens really fast. So, for example, in New York, where a judge did issue an order under under the writ of habeas corpus in 2000, I think 2015, uh, uh Barbara Jaffe, sitting in the New York Supreme Court, became the first judge, you know, in the United States to issue a, a um, an order under the under a habeas corpus case. That for us, I think that was the that was the uh, the fourth time or the fifth time that we had brought a suit, and on the fifth time, she, you know, we finally had a judge who did so, and she then ordered a hearing. I think 72 hours later. That's what happens in habeas corpus, corpus cases. They're very fast. We want them to be very fast because we don't, and there's very few discovery. In some states, there's none at all. And so um, if we're going to lose or we're going to win, we want to do it immediately. If we, if we can do it within a week or two weeks, that's fine. We don't want to spend one year or two years or three years or four years litigating a case that we could win or that we could lose because we, we need to go up to the head to the highest court and we, we don't want to spend all the time litigating in the trial court. We want to get up to the highest courts as soon as we can. So we're able to do that. And of course, one of the things is a very little discovery or maybe none at all. And of course, it's very cheap to file that kind of a lawsuit uh, because you, because uh, it's just us filing the suit. And oftentimes we can file them, them ex parte and the other side doesn't even know that we, we did it and didn't didn't oppose us. The next thing is, as I talked about, the common law is that the common law is flexible. So it, it allows that. It allows us to to ask the court to be flexible. Also, there's usually no requirement to exhaust any kind of administrative remedies. Also, we try to explain to the court that that uh, habeas corpus has been used sometimes you know, to establish the personhood of entities beings who up until that time may not have been seen as persons. So we can give them two examples. One of them is one I already gave you, which is the uh, the um, case of Somerset versus Stewart, the question of James Somerset. But also in 1875, there was a case involving a um, an American indigenous chief, and he had been part of a tribe taken out of Kansas and brought to Oklahoma where he did not want to go. And so he, he came back, and his name was Standing Bear. When Standing Bear... Uh, came back, he was then put into jail and he, he sought a writ of habeas corpus. And the, um, the U.S. Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General, who brought the habeas corpus stated that, um, I'm sorry, he didn't bring it. Standing Bear's lawyer brought the writ of habeas corpus. When the Assistant U.S. Attorney opposed that, he, he, he argued that habeas corpus could not apply to a, an American indigenous person. They only apply to white to white folks, and that court didn't accept that. But that was the argument that 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 was made. So we then, you know, bring our our writ of habeas corpus. We we bring a common law writ of habeas corpus. Now, the arguments that we make um, are that we want the judge uh, to find that our client is a you know ought to have a common law right to bodily liberty, uh, because they have to have a right to bodily liberty if they're if 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 our client is imprisoned, whether she's an elephant, uh, whether uh, in a um, um, chimpanzee, uh, eventually will be our, our next species will, is likely to be an, an, an orca. Uh, you know, we have to uh, determine, um, you know, what who they are. You know, can can you know are they the kind of beings who even should should be persons? And so. We try to understand what do judges care? You know, what what are, what are they going to care about? What are their values and principles? So, you know, I mean, I've written probably four books now. My fifth one's coming out, 22 law review articles other people have. And these might have to do with 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 uh, issues that we believe are true or ought to be true or things that 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 the judges ought to agree with. But it, it may turn out that they don't. So we put our own personal values and principles to one side. And sometimes we will spend years. In fact, oftentimes we do. We never file a lawsuit in a jurisdiction that we haven't spent years trying to understand what are the most important values and principles that the judges in that jurisdiction hold. So it, it appears to us certainly with in the United States that they, they definitely um, uh, value liberty and they value equality. And so we try to 
make the arguments that our client then should be viewed as an entity with the right to bodily liberty protected by by habeas corpus you know because uh, you know but because we 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 invoke their values of liberty and their values of equality and um, and that's why we and we bring our experts in you know who talk about for example the idea of, of autonomy <coughs> excuse me our experts come in and at great length they they will explain why are non-human animal clients so far uh, chimpanzees and elephants it'll be the same thing with with orcas why they are autonomous beings and we sometimes we'll, we'll file hundreds of, of, of pages i think when we filed our chimpanzee cases i think there were approximately 400 references to peer-reviewed um, scientific articles about the cognitive ability of ch chimpanzees there are probably 150 to 200 with, with elephants there are probably 50 to 100 of them with respect to to orcas because chimpanzees are, are probably one of the most studied um, species you know that that they that there are and we bring them in and they then they then make they they, they then argue and show how our client is autonomous and then we argue uh, that uh, that the cases that the judges decide both both based on liberty and equality oftentimes will take a, a, a great deal of, of importance into autonomy you know, if you're an autonomous being that will make your liberty argument and your equality argument much much deeper much much more uh you're, you're going to be much more liable if you can if you can invoke liberty and equality uh to getting you know what what you want to get so what we then did is you know putting these together and to, I, i've only explained some of the things um, i remember i i i except in the last year when i like everyone else i've been sitting in my office uh before then I tend to travel the world, you know, all the time, and I probably traveled in 40, 40, 45 countries, you know, so I might be speaking in Japan, you know, in Hong Kong and Australia and India and in uh, Nepal, you know, in Africa and South America, Europe, and we try to, um, uh, we try to, um, you know, understand, uh, you know, what, what judges actually also uh, like in you know what what sort of principles do they like in in those jurisdictions? So when we bring those kinds of, of cases, again, we might believe that equality and liberty are the most important. But if it turns out that in another jurisdiction, you know, outside of the United States, maybe a judge won't agree with that. And then we try to understand what do those judges agree on. That could sometimes be hard because a lot of our cases are in Spanish-speaking um, countries, and we don't speak Spanish, so we have to get do, get a lot of translation. In obviously in in in, in Israel. You know, I don't speak Hebrew. There's no, there's no one who speaks Hebrew in the organization, but we work with a, a lot of the Israeli lawyers who speak Hebrew, who then have to translate, you know, the, the, the cases and statutes we're, we're looking at so we can draft our habeas corpus petition in English, and then it gets translated into, in, into Hebrew when, when it gets filed. So we began by filing in, in, in the state of New York, and we began, we, began, we began by bringing, you know, lawsuits first on behalf of chimpanzees. And what, what happened, I won't even talk about what happened in the, in the lower court cases. Most of the judges were, whether they were support us or not, they didn't have any intention of ruling in our favor because they were Supreme Court judges, which in, in New York uh, is, the, is the equivalent of a, of a Superior Court judge in, in Vermont. They didn't want to, to um, stretch it, you know, to stretch out and, and take this. And sometimes they would say that. I agree with you, but but uh, I'm not going to be the first person to make that kind of decision. So New York then has four intermediate appellate courts, and then has one high court, uh, which is a uh, which is the Court of Appeals, and that's where we ran into really interesting things. So the first case, for example, um, in on on Long Island, which is the second department, when when we appealed, you know, to our astonishment, they sua sponte, you know, on their own, they said uh, they s sent us a a decision after a New York uh, lawyer had said, will, will you please allow Stephen Wise, who's a Massachusetts lawyer, to argue the appeal in the in, in your court in the second department. Uh, the, that was denied, not because they didn't want me, they, but because they, they said that um, that we didn't have the right to appeal. Well, that was the first time that we, we ran into a, uh, an, an, an appellate 
court that was just completely wrong. They were just completely off the wall. Of course, we had a right to appeal. And no court has ever said we didn't have a right to appeal. But they decided that's how they were going to handle our case. You don't have a right to appeal. We decided not to not, not to spend a year or two trying to go to the, the Court of Appeals because another thing about, you know, about about our, our cases is that, as I said, there's no rest judicata. We can just bring them again and again. And in, in New York, you can bring them in front of any judge we want. So we just said, okay, that happened. The second case we brought has been an important case, um, completely wrong. That court as well has been totally wrong. Uh, but other courts have just kind of automatically followed them sometimes. So it's been a very damaging case to us. And so we're hoping um, that when we go to the Court of Appeals in New York, that it will reverse that because it's wrong. And the one judge I said who uh, in 2018, Judge Fahey, actually noted that they were just wrong. And we know that they're wrong. But until the Court of Appeals takes the case, it, 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 it still stands. Although, uh, we, you know, we argue, I know this kind of argument stands, but, you know, the one highest, highest judge who's in New York who's ruled on this has just pointed out that it's completely wrong. And what they did is that they they thought it had it, that the only people who could get rights, the only entities could get rights, would be those who could engage in a social contract. And engaging into a social contract gave you rights. They they um, relied upon a um, a law professor who got it completely backwards. And it, it, so it, it actually it turns out that what happens is that um, that's that's not the rule. We're, if we're born with rights, we're born with the capacity for rights, because how could, how could anyone ever enter, enter into a, a social contract if you're not a person? You have to be able to be a person to enter into any contract. So the idea that somehow you become a person after entering into a contract just doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, and so what, what a social contract does is it doesn't produce persons, it produces citizens. But the court did not grasp what we were talking about, and other courts don't grasp what we're talking about either. Finally, Judge, Judge Fahey did, and some of the lower court judges have grasped it. Then they say, we understand what you're saying, you're right, but unfortunately, we're, we're bound by this, this higher court, even though we don't want to be. So um, we're fighting on that. Another thing, which those of you who are lawyers or law students will kind of be amazed are there are all kinds of things that amaze us is that uh, they cited Black's Law Dictionary who cited um, a secondary source that said in order to be able to be a person you have to be able to have the capacity both for rights you know and for duties and chimpanzees for example don't have the rights for duty don't have the capacity they only have and so therefore they can't have any rights either uh, we had no idea where they got that from we never heard of such thing. And by the time we, we found it in the Library of Congress, we realized that Black's Law Dictionary had actually uh, misquoted the secondary source and got it backwards. Uh, and and what he actually said was that uh, that, it, that an entity uh, has a right if you if you have the, the ability uh, for rights, not and duties, but rights or duties. So if you have the capacity for rights or you have the capacity for duty, Duty, you're, you're a person. So eventually, we're hoping that that is going to be overturned. The third, that was the third, the the uh, third department in New York. Now we go into the fourth department in New York, and they don't, they don't, they don't follow that. I, we don't know whether they don't believe in it, uh, or they, they, they didn't want, they, they just didn't want to accept it. It was only a month later. They made another mistake, which again, um, the uh, court of appeals judge has also said. By the way, they made that, they made that mistake too. This, this time, the third straight error that the uh, appellate courts made was that they, they then said that um, they, they, they said they're going to assume that our client could, could be a person, but they're saying that because we want them to be taken out of their cage, the chimpanzee out of their cage and brought to a sanctuary in Florida, uh, that's, you can't use habeas corpus for that. I won't bother explaining why. There's only two cases on this issue, and for some reason, they got the two backwards, which is what Judge Fahey noted as well. You got the judge, you know, you got them backwards. If you'd gotten those two correct, you would not have, you, you would not have said that. Then we went to the, that ended up in the, in the last appellate judge, uh, intermediate appellate court judge was in, in, um, in, in the first department in, in um, New York City. And they then said, hey, the reason you can't have rights is because only humans can have rights except they didn't explain why a human could have rights. Uh, it's kind of a, a difference between being descriptive and prescriptive. Um, and 
they can say only humans have rights, but they gave no reason why that would be true. And there is no reason why that would be true. We, we told them, you know, and at one point people said only men can have rights. Only white people can have rights. Um, you, know, you, you, know, you, you can say that, but, you know, do we have to embarrass ourselves again by saying things that are irrational and, and, and absurd? And if you're, if you're going to say only humans can have rights, you have to have some kind of a reason. But you don't have any more reason than, than the people who said only black, only white people can have rights, only men can have rights. Uh, so again, up we uh, up up we go to the court of appeals there, and now we 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 have the case involving Happy, uh, the the elephant, and we will now know in the next uh, sometime week to month or so as to whether or not they'll do that. So um, when I once was argued, was um, uh, speaking in Japan, I walked into a, a classroom once and I just turned and said, how long would you like me to speak? And they said for four hours, uh, I actually did speak for four hours. So today was one hour. So um, I guess you got about a quarter of what I, I would have talked about if I'd had more time. But now I think I'm finished and I would love to have anyone have any questions uh, or anything that they want to ask me or we can talk about. Okay, super. Thank you so much for that talk, Stephen. Um, for our oh, audience members, we have a few minutes for some questions from the audience. Um, we'll, we're, we're running close to two o'clock, but we can we can take a few, a few minutes. So if you have questions to put in the chat that you haven't already, please go ahead. Um, if you're watching on the um, VLS website live stream, you can click on the watch on live stream icon at the bottom of the video to bring up the chat box where you can add your question or if you're on Facebook, um, add your question to the comment box below. And we'll try to get as many as we can. Um, our first question is from our colleague, Tracy Hester, um, who asks, did you consider how historical doctrines of manumission might apply to create personhood for non-human animals? Not only did we, but I wrote a law review article on that. So yes, the answer is uh, yes, we did. And um, and uh, we have a law review article I wrote um, on on the question of uh, you know when when you when when a black slave say in the United States manumitted uh, that slave, then then that that master could turn the slave into a person. And uh, that's one that's that was the uh, purpose of the of the article. And that's something that we think about. And there might be some time uh, in which we will. Uh, we have talked about uh, speaking to people who wish to um, manumit their non-human animal. And then the question, and we would then bring a declaratory judgment case, trying to determine whether or not, whether the process of manumitting her uh, actually changed her status from being a thing to a person. Oops, I can't hear you, Jenny. Thank you. I said the next no, one we have is a two part question and um, I'll read both parts at once and you can take it up as sure. you like. What role do the emotional or empathetic aspects of your cases play in crafting arguments versus highlighting the more cold technical or procedural aspects of the law? And how do you balance these considerations to craft the most persuasive arguments? Well, you know, judge, you know, we're not arguing in front of a computer, we're arguing in front of a judge. So um, we we try to make the we try to make the best legal arguments we can, but we also understand that uh, that judges will also you know feel a certain way emotionally. And so we try to uh, to both appeal to their emotions and to also to their brain, um, to their to their mind. Um, sometimes and uh, uh, you can you can follow us uh, uh, in in the in the um, HBO film about us, unlocking the cage. You can see some of what of what goes on in our, uh, uh, you know, in, in our oral arguments, and and of course uh, some of them haven't haven't been shot. But we also have we also have oral arguments where uh, where we we bring in a um, stenog a, a videographer who then shoots the case usually from the back. Although you can take a look, for example, on the November twenty second, twenty twenty one, in which I argued in front of the first department. You know, those judges obviously, um, you know, were like kind of emotionally clueless and intellectually clueless as to as to what what I was talking about. That happens sometimes, and we, you know, we're we're used to it. And sometimes you'll see judges who actually get you know get angry 
uh, with me. So we understand that, you know, we're dealing with, with that kind of an emotional response to what we're doing. That's going to happen. You know, behind me, I probably have, I probably have 150 books on human slavery, abolition, civil rights, litigation. And so I understand that, that, that the process that we go through went through Went, went through that as well. Certainly abolitionists, civil rights lawyers, they used to run into the same sort of, of problems because they'd go in front of white judges who would get very angry at the, at the, uh, the idea that a, that a black person could ever have a right. And so we, you know, we, we've understood it. And then it can happen with white people, it can happen with, with, with women, it could happen with Native Americans. We've seen all of these things. And so, you know, we, we do the best we can. Um, but we, you know, sometimes we get judges who don't have any, who actually are, are actually angry at us, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes we can see that they that they're sympathetic to us, and so uh, you can see, for example, um, in the lower court in involving uh, Happy the Elephant, uh, Judge Allison Tewitt, who's in the Supreme Court in the Bronx, um, as opposed to most of the judges who gave us like ten minutes to argue, she gave us thirteen hours. We had three days, and we had thirteen hours of oral argument. And, uh, and by the end of that, you know, we had persuaded her and her whole lawsuit is about how we persuaded her. But then at the end, she says, well, I'm still bound by those those folks who said that um, that um, you, you're basically you have to be a human. I'm, but if they didn't say that, you know, and I, I, I think you should win. But right now, as a trial court judge, I'm stuck there. So we just do the best we can. We understand that it's going that it, it's a process. And. Uh, we're now seven years into it, and we've made a lot of progress in seven years. We're hoping we make even more progress in the next seven years. Okay, thank you. One more question before we wrap up. You've been practicing yep. animal law for quite some time, um, teaching animal law pretty much since the beginning of animal law as a doctrinal legal topic. Um, what has surprised you the most about where we are now in the field? Oh, what where surprised we me most, um, we started nowhere. <laughs> we, we just started nowhere. Um, and so, you know, when, when I began, I be, actually began this 1980, and I, I think I became president of the Animal Legal Defense Fund in, in 1985, but I became a member of them in 1981. Um, we, like, we, we, we were just nowhere. We tried, we, we had a hard time. We spent years and years just trying to figure out what, what we could do. Uh, you know, the, the the place that we've come over the last 35 years or so is is way beyond anything we could have imagined. We we I did not think that in my lifetime I'd be able to to reach the place where where we are now, and so now you know we're we're picking up speed. Uh, you may not know, for example, the Indian Supreme Court has ruled that all animals in India have both statutory and constitutional rights, all of them. You know, cockroaches. <laughs> elephants, all of them. And so, you know, when I, when I was in India, um, you know, I sat down at breakfast with the Supreme Court justice who wrote it to try to understand what he'd been talking about. Um, and, and then we, we also had lunch with another Indian, Indian uh, high court judge in Delhi who had ruled that uh, all, you can't keep a bird in a cage. And he ordered all these cages to be open because birds, he says, have a fundamental right, right to fly. You know, there's also been a chimpanzee now in um in uh, Argentina, who's been ordered free. There's an orangutan. There were five cases. He, the orangutan was ordered freed three times and, and was not ordered freed twice. Um, there, was a, there was a dissent. The Colombian Constitutional Court involving a uh, spectacle bear uh, said that they could not bring a habeas corpus, but it was seven to two. And the major decision, dissenting case, quoted all the work of me, of the Non-Human Rights Project, of Judge Fahey in the New York, New York Court of Appeals, uh, right now, we're going in front of the Ecuador Constitutional Court. We're filing an, an amicus brief with the, with, with the Harvard Law School. You know, we're filing it together, and um, on the issue which they have brought before them, which is is it is is a monk that does a monkey have a right to habeas corpus uh, that comes from the right of nature section in the Ecuadorian Constitution? Um, same thing in, in Israel, where you know we're making other arguments in Israel. Um, Things are really picking up all over the world. They're moving faster and faster. And also, even if I'm not arguing a case, if I'm speaking around the world, I oftentimes have judges come up to me and say, I'm a judge in this country. And if you made this argument in front of me, you would win. It's moving. It's moving. It just, you know, it's not anywhere near 100. You know, maybe we're, we're moving towards 20 or 30 or 40, but we were at zero when, when we began. 
Well, that's an optimistic and encouraging note to end on. Thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us thank for this talk. And thank you so much to our audience members who joined us. This was the last of our animal law lectures in this series, um, but we are planning to do much more in this space. So stay tuned to hear more about that. Thank you so much. Goodbye.